Sure. All right. Well, good afternoon, or I should say good morning, everyone. It's uh, not afternoon yet, but uh, I'll call this meeting to order uh, for April 9th, uh, 2020, uh, County Council. Uh, I guess we're starting about, uh, I guess it's a little after 10 o'clock. We had a few uh, technical difficulties there, but we got those uh, worked out from our great staff and we're moving forward. Um, at this time, I, well, I'm going to suggest again, uh, if you have a cell phone, to please put it on mute. And when you're not speaking, speaking uh, to the uh, Zoom portion of this meeting, then to put yourself on mute also, so we don't get the background noise. And at this time, Madam Clerk, will you do the roll call, please? Thank you, Mr. Warden. I have all of the councillors in attendance. Uh, Councillor Gamble sends his regrets. Councillor Woodbury will be late arriving. And Councillor Burley will be joining us shortly. Everyone else is in attendance. Okay, thank you for that, Madam Clerk. And just for uh, everybody to know what I will do as we move forward this, I have a list of movers and seconders and I will ask anybody opposed to the motion, if I hear no opposition to it, I will uh, say then or declare it's carried. Okay, and if you do wish to oppose, I will give a little bit of a break there just so if I can't see you, the uh, clerk can watch the chat or whatever or and we'll, we'll take our time going through this so everybody has an opportunity to, uh, to have input, okay? Uh, seeing that, uh, is there any decoration of, of pecuniary interest uh, to the agenda that's uh, on today? All right, I don't hear anything. Uh, Madam Clerk, is there any, any indication there? There is not, Mr. Warden. Okay, thank you. Uh, if one does, one does arise, you can declare at that time. Uh, moving forward, uh, our first set of business is A, item A is the County Council and Committee Minutes of the Whole. And I have that moved by uh, Councillor Keeveny and Councillor Millen. Is there any discussion on those set of minutes? Okay, anything there, Madam Clerk? Nothing there, Mr. Warden. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing none, any, uh, any opposed? Okay, seeing none, that is carried. Item B uh, is the second set of minutes of the closed session of March 12th. And I have that moved by Councillor Hicks. Uh, well, it's second by Councillor Woodbury, but he is not in the meeting at this time. So I, can I have an indication from somebody else who wishes to second that? Councillor Potter will second it. Councillor Potter, okay, thank you. Okay, that is on the floor. Are there any any uh, item to discuss on that set of minutes? Okay, I don't hear anything. Uh, any opposed to that motion? Okay, hearing none, that is carried. Okay, uh, item C, these are the minutes uh, from the Committee of Management uh, of March 10th. And I have that moved by Councillor Mackey and second by Councillor Kibini. And the motion's on the floor. Are there any, any items to be discussed in, in that set of minutes? Any errors or omissions? Okay, seeing none. Uh, oh, no. Councillor, Councillor Hicks. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, my question is with respect to page three of those uh, minutes, page 17 of our package. Um, it was uh, mentioned that, uh, I'm going to read here. Yes, that uh, noted that the BSTU was to be at Lee Manor, but this was pulled in 2019 due to information that identified an impact on service delivery and county finances. First, I'm really happy to see that we are making uh, an application for Great Gables, but I wonder if you could give more information about what I read on page 17 with respect to the move from um, Lee Manor. Lee Manor, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, Madam CEO, do you wish to speak to this? I will speak to this and me and uh, if I've missed something then then Jennifer can jump in. Um, Council will be aware that um, we've been working on an application for a behavioral support transition unit 
um, for, a, for several years now. Um, and it's been, you know, some of the, um, both the requirements, but also um, the funding of this has shifted over the time. And as we learned more about it and looked at um, the opportunities that were available to us at Lee Manor, um, it became clear that it was going to have some significant uh, financial impact to Gray County to be able to run this uh, the way that um, staff and the and the Lynn, for that matter, felt would be optimal. Um, Lee Manor has the larger resident home areas, and so in order to keep this behavioral support transition unit essentially whole, so that you weren't trying to manage um, our our regular residents in addition to these higher acuity residents, um, we were going to have to set beds, um, either set beds in abeyance or um, we just, we wouldn't, we would lose the funding for those beds if they, if they weren't filled. And um, that was going to have a material impact on the, the overall um, net uh, of the operations at Lee Manor. So by um, putting the application forward for Gray Gables, which has the smaller resident home areas, those, the, the funded beds for the BSTU, don't have an impact on on other parts of the operation because you're not having to set beds aside. Um, we looked carefully at how you could manage the separation um, of the of the BSTU clients along with the regular residents, and even that there was a going to need to be some significant capital outlay um, to make that happen. It still wouldn't have been optimal. So with discussions with, with the Lynn and with the staff at Lee Manor and Jennifer, it was determined that moving to Gray Gables really made more sense. So Mr. Warden, is the, um, is the plan then that we would be centralizing the behavioral support beds at uh, Gray Gables for Gray County? I would say so, but I, maybe Jennifer would, Jennifer, do you wish to speak further on this? Sure, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, so the, the behavioral transition unit would, uh, would take over one home area of the uh, Gray Gables site. So uh, 22, we, the application seems like 100 years ago, <laughs> uh, but I believe it was for a, a 20 bed long-term care home and, and so we would still have 66 beds in Gray Gables um, filled. 20 of them would be behavioral support uh, transition uh, residents. Does that so, so just to clarify then, all of Gray County's behavioral support beds would be at Gray Gables? Um, just the transition unit. So uh, there would still be residents with dementia and uh, responsive behaviors that are supported similarly in all long-term care homes. So there would still be those residents in all of our three long-term care homes. But the BSTU would be a special designated unit, a transition unit to support uh, long-term care, the hospital and long-term care homes across Gray County in supporting those residents who shouldn't be living in hospital, but are not quite ready to transition into uh, a regular long-term care home bed. This would be that in between that step down. If I can add to it, just like our long-term care homes are not um, only for Gray County residents, this BSTU, there's only a handful of them in the whole province. So this would be a site, I think more to support like probably the southwestern Ontario. Um, and so people could come to it um, from anywhere. So uh, any further question there, uh, Councillor Hicks? I think I saw your thumb go up, right? Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam CEO, and, and thank you, uh, Jennifer, for, for that. Any other discussion on those sets of minutes? Okay, uh, I'm gonna go for the vote then. Any opposed to the motion? 
All right, that's carried. Uh, moving on then to the CAO Performance Evaluation Committee minutes. I have that moved by Councillor Patterson and second by Councillor Desai. Uh, the motion's on the floor. Is there any discussion on those sets of minutes? Okay, I don't see anybody. Uh, any opposed to that motion? Okay, that is carried. Okay, we move on to item five on our agenda. Uh, close uh, meeting matters if required. I don't see anything listed there. Uh, I don't uh, indicate anything there. So item six, this is with regards to the notice of, uh, so business arising from the minutes, uh, notice of intention to reconsider uh, provided by March 12th, 2020 from a notice of motion that came from uh, Councillor uh, O'Leary. And I have this for uh, reconsideration. It's a, uh, it's uh, moved by Councillor O'Leary and second by Councillor Mackey to put this back on the floor for reconsideration. Uh, and, Mr. Uh, Warden? Yes. Sorry, can I just get an update for, from someone on the status of Councillor Burley? I am quite concerned that he hasn't been able to join us yet. I don't really want to go forward with this part of the agenda if everybody isn't here that should be here. Um, um, Madam Jody. Madam. Yes, Jody. Uh, Nancy's working with Dwight right now. It sounded like it might have been a Wi Fi issue. He was switching over to his Mac to see if he could get connected with that. Um, that was just one minute ago or so. Do you suggest uh, I move on to the motions on the floor right now? Um, I'm not sure if we take a, take a recess or we wait a minute or. or there's not, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm at the mercy of, of <laughs> County Council. Uh, um, yeah, so I guess to you, Madam CEO, you felt that he had a, an interest to speak to this motion. Is, uh, is that how you're thinking, Madam CEO? I, I haven't had direct conversation um, with him on this matter. I just, I would just feel better um, given the, the interest in it if, if everybody was available to us okay. if that can happen. And if it can't within the next minute or so, we'll just have to move ahead. So, uh, well, uh, then why don't, uh, if, if maybe there's other discussion on this and then we'll, 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 we'll keep it on to, for him to join, if that's okay, Madam CAO? Thank you, sir. Okay, so the motion again is, is moved by uh, Councilor Leary, second by Councilor Mackey. To put it on the floor, and this is a notice of reconsideration from a decision that was done in July of 2019. I guess I'll first go to the mover, Councillor O'Leary. Do you wish to uh, speak to this uh, motion that's on the floor? Um, I do. I've got some concerns with some of the letters that came through, um, especially with the the, the one saying that we're, we could be leaving a million dollars on the table. So I don't know if someone wants to speak to that. So, Madam CAO, maybe I'll go back to you first and then maybe to Michael. I think that um, those discussions will be most appropriately held at the time that, that um, Randy makes the presentation. Um, what, this what this reconsideration motion does is allows us to um, have then those conversations about the merits of a decision one way or another. This just will facilitate us being able to do that. If there's a nod and interest in, in reconsidering at all, then we don't really have a way forward to have those future discussions. Okay, thanks for that clarification. That help? Right. So, so basically, Gordon, sorry, go ahead. I have Councillor Desai that would like to speak to this item. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, Councillor Desai. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, Councillor O'Leary has, uh, has asked a question that I was going to. So, um, thank you for thank you to Kim for uh, the, the response. Okay, I think uh, I have Councillor Body, uh, Madam Clerk. Is that correct? Oh no, no. Okay. And we do have Councillor Burley has joined us now. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, Councillor Burley. <laughs> um, okay, just just for your information, Councillor Burley. The notice of reconsideration is on the floor. It was moved by Councillor O'Leary, second by Councillor Mackey. 
And this is just for the reconsideration of what we're doing with the quarry. And uh, the, there was a question asked with regards to the letters and that will be dealt with in the committee of the whole to the, to the report that is first on the agenda there. So, so uh, I guess in, just in summary, Madam CAO, by, by supporting us, opens it back up for read new discussion on what we want to do with the, uh, the quarry itself. So it that, doesn't, we're not locked. That's, that's entirely correct. This is just right. facilitating the ability for us to have co another conversation about um, whether or not we wish to change direction. Right. And this was sort of somewhat explained to us by Michael a few weeks back when we were going through this process. And uh, does Michael, does Michael, I know we're not in camera or this is the open session is, should I, uh, should, but Michael, do I need to, any clarity from, uh, from Michael, our, our solicitor, Madam CEO? Certainly, Michael, if, if you want to add anything to the comments that have already been made, are you content? Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, there's nothing really to add. I think this is entirely appropriate to focus on the question of reconsideration at this point. Uh, okay. Further consideration of the actual comments on the proposal would go to uh, Committee of the Whole. Right. This just allows that process. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Warden, I, I do see um, Councillor Hicks's hand raised. I'm not sure if he has a question or not. No? Uh, no. Councillor Hicks? That was a hand raised for my previous question. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to be sure. Okay, well, that's, thank you, Madam Clerk. Just, it's good to be, you know, we want to make sure we have all opportunity for people to ask questions. Okay, so- And Councillor so Soever would like to speak. Okay. Go ahead, Council Storber. Yes, Mr. Warden. Um, I was just wondering, uh, since um, you know the uh, the instruction or the direction from Council was last July, I was wondering um, how far we actually got in considering the lease option, and if there was any information that came out of that process that might um, help our deliberations today. Okay, thank you for that, and I. I guess I would direct that either to the Director okay. of Transportation, Pat Boy. Uh, Pat, do you have a comment to, uh, to that? Sorry, my internet's cutting in and out here. I missed that question. Could you repeat that? Councillor Soever? Yes, um, I was, uh, you know, since that direction to investigate a, a possibility of a lease was uh, last July, um, I was wondering it, how far that process uh, got and whether there was any information that came out of that process that might be uh, useful for our deliberation today. Um, we were working on it. I guess all I could say was it was gonna be very complicated because we weren't sure um, if we were asking for an amount or to charge something for a monthly rent or yearly rent versus a royalty on payments. So. Uh, we had a little ways to go to finish it, but um, so there was nothing groundbreaking that came out of there that um, we really discovered, no. Any, if any I, oh, go ahead, Madam CEO. If I can, just to, so just to clarify for all of council, um, we had been working on developing an appropriate um, lease agreement that we could then put out um, for interested operators to consider um, and and because this is this was new ground for us, Pat had had to do an awful lot of outreach into the um, various experts to try and determine what um, the the best way to structure this was. Um, but we had never actually put anything on the street and had never brought a potential lease back to council. Um, we were had started that work in the fall, but at the same time, then I think was it in October that we had the direction to um, to have the outreach on this new property. So the two things um, kind of crossed, if you will, in their timing. Okay, any follow-up there, Councillor Soever? Uh, thank you, no, um, I guess, I was just wondering, you know, given, 
but I guess there's no indication of, of value from the process um, that was underway because we didn't get far enough. So I have nothing further. And uh, by the way, welcome to uh, County Council. Uh, welcome back for your uh, time off there. And I forgot to mention that at the beginning. So thanks for, for joining us uh, again. I know you've been following along and, uh, and, that, and just from that, I know you've been off for a period of time. Do you have any general questions with regards to this? Because uh, um, I know the minutes and that sort of capture, but you missed the last meeting. So that may be more in the committee of the whole that you maybe have questions in that part. Any other questions uh, from County Council? Um, any sign of uh, Mr. Woodbury, Councillor Woodbury joining us? I know, um, Madam Clerk, you were saying that he may be joining us. Yes, he indicated he was going to join us later. Um, okay. But I haven't seen him join as of yet. Okay. All right. Any further discussion on this notice of reconsideration? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to put it to, to vote. So. Are there any opposed to this motion? And I'm gonna help you, Madam Clerk, if there's any opposition for you to forward that through a chat or seeing somebody's hand. Any opposed to this resolution? Madam Clerk? I see no hands raised and I see nothing in the chat, Warden. Okay, so that motion is carried then. We have no bylaws. Uh, for today, uh, generally at the at this uh, agenda, we do have uh, a section there for good news and and all that stuff. But we weren't sure whether we should have that in there or not. We will have opportunity to have a conversation on the next on the committee of the whole with regards to COVID nineteen. And if there's, I'll, I'll I'll have some leeway there. Maybe if there's other conversations during that point on our committee of the whole, if you wish to talk about events or issues in your um, municipalities. So. At this time, I have a motion to adjourn and uh, moved by Councillor Burley and second by Councillor Desai. Um, is there anybody opposed to that uh, adjournment? Seeing none, we're adjourned then. Our council meeting is now adjourned at, uh, I'm going to say, what, 1025, Madam Clerk? Yes, Mr. Warden. Okay. All right. Does anybody need to go get a glass of orange juice? That's Councillor. Hex has there, right? Nice. It's just, it's very inviting. <laughs> okay. Um, we should move along here fairly quickly. I don't know. Do you want to, do you want to take two minutes to get a glass of water or whatever before we get into the committee of the whole? Is that needed? I'm, um, cause I was thinking of going and get a glass of water here. So just hang in there and I'm going to go glass up. You can look at the little hole in my ceiling where the stove pipe used to go. <laughs> All right, I'm, and uh, Councillor Hex, I got my orange juice. <laughs> Very good. All right, so moving on to our, our committee of the whole, and uh, seeing that this is a, a revised agenda, and I understand, uh, Madam Clerk, the revision through terror was the delegation that uh, the three attachments were added from the original uh, agenda. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? That is correct, Mr. Warden. Okay, thank you. So, um, all right, so I'm gonna call this meeting to order. And uh, we'll say that's, uh, I don't know what time it is, 1027 or something like that. <clears throat> is there any declaration of uh, interest with regards to the agenda of the Committee of the Whole with the um, members here today? Uh, any any, uh, any interest there, Madam Clerk? You see nothing that I see, Mr. Warden. Okay, so then I will say there isn't any, and if one does declare, you can declare at that time, as you know. So then we have here the three delegation letters, Madam Clerk. That's sort of it, it, for information, I presume, as if it was people speaking to us. So, but it is information that's pertaining to the other parts of the agenda. Is that correct? That is correct. We put them on. Um, 
as delegations. They are written delegations due to our electronic participation right now. And they are for your information and related to the first report under items for direction. Okay, thank you for that. And just for procedural moving forward and this electronic um, meeting. So um, as we post um, future agendas, that, that will be a process for the public that will be able to make written uh, written delegation uh, formats like this? Do we, yes. Are we explain it? Okay. Yes, that is. And, and we will treat them exactly the same way we would if, if someone were here in person and they were presenting a, a PowerPoint presentation. Good. Okay. Thank you very much for that. All right. So then we're moving down to item four, items for direction and discussion. And at this time, uh, this is a report from our Director of Planning, uh, Randy Switzer. And we do have a mover and a seconder, and that's moved by Council O'Leary and second by Councilor Desai. And I presume Randy's out there somewhere to speak to the report. Um, thank you, uh, Warden McQueen. Can everyone hear me? All right, uh, I was gonna try and share a screen, but it says host disabled participant screen sharing. <laughs> Is that something that can be turned on, Rob? You're good, Randy. Okay, uh, just one second, I'll try and pull this up here. One second. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It looks good. Great. Um, so thank you, Warren McQueen. So the purpose of this report uh, is to present a, a proposed property exchange of the county quarry for lands in the Miss Polly West Gray in the settlement area of Durham. Everyone see the second slide there? It's it the, the second slide is smaller, Randy, but I don't know if you if you were able to switch it to a bigger screen. Or can you advance it at the bottom of your screen to go to slide two? <coughs> Excuse me. Look like you can. Randy, I think what we're seeing is your presentation view with your yeah. speaker's notes on it right before you minimized it. And not that your mouse isn't moving on the screen, but that helps. Okay, let me just try again here. So what are, you, what are you able to see right now? It's the speaker view. Rather than presentation view. Okay. See yes, now we can still see your speaker's notes, but we can, it advanced to slide two. Okay. Um, let me see how I can change this. Just bear with me one second. Sorry, I have my notes on one screen, right? And so I have to <laughs> have those in order to speak to the report. Uh, okay. Let's try that. Still just the speaker notes? It's okay. No, we see the main slide, Randy. You can work like okay. that. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Let me. Uh... See the second side now? Yeah, it's good, Randy. <clears throat> and still can. <laughs> so I'm trying to manage multiple screens here. So. Okay, so in, uh, in September 2019, the province approved the construction of a 128 bed long-term care facility uh, to be built in the settlement area of Durham in West Gray. And, and this new facility would replace the existing 100 bed Rockwood Terrace long-term care home. Following the province's approval, council directed staff to investigate property options in Durham 
for the development of this new long-term care home. It's estimated that the county needs approximately four to six acres to construct this new facility. Property options were reviewed, which identified at the time there were, there were limited options available that were large enough to construct the new Rockwood Terrace. And following this initial review, review of properties in Durham, council directed staff on November 28th to pursue the acquisition of a property adjacent to the current Rockwood Terrace facility and to enter into discussions with the landowner to determine if they'd be interested in selling a portion of that property. County staff engaged the landowner being Durham Stone and Paving Inc. And as per council's direction, and when approached on, on November 28th, the landowner presented an option of a land exchange for the larger property in, in Durham in exchange for the county quarry. Based on a review of the offer from Durham Stone Paving, Council directed staff to negotiate a land exchange agreement subject to due diligence inspections and subject to final approval of the agreement by County Council. Staff with the assistance of outside legal counsel proceeded to negotiate a land exchange agreement with DSPI. Due diligence inspections were then undertaken by both County staff and DSPI and County staff and DSPI confirmed to each other in late February that they were satisfied with the results of those inspections. I'll try to advance the next slide. Can you see the Durham property there? Yes. Okay. I'll just go back to my notes. So the lands being offered in exchange for the county quarry are shown in blue and purple on the maps on your screen. And these are parts B, B1, B2, C, and D. The, the subject lands are located south of Gray Road 4 and east of Highway 6 and directly south of the existing Rockwood Terrace long-term care home. The lands to be potentially acquired are approximately 32 acres in size. Uh, the lands can also be accessed uh, via five existing public roads. Parts A, E, and F, or the red areas on the map, would be retained by DSPI. The lands identified as Part C and Part D in Figure 1 would allow for a future extension of South Street East from Concarden Street South to Concession 1. And both Part C and Part D would be acquired by the county, but would be leased back to DSPI for a period of 10 years. This lease is required by, by Durham Stone and Paving to complete any remaining extraction of aggregate in Part F in accordance with their existing aggregate license, which requires that it maintain control of Part D as a setback during extraction. County staff understand that there's minimal activity that occurs within that existing aggregate operation today. Currently, Part C, D, E, and F in Figure 1 are part of the existing aggregate license owned and operated by DSPI. Should the land exchange move forward, Durham Stone Paving would revise the existing license by removing parts E and C on the map from the aggregate license immediately. Uh, those would be removed immediately and then eventually removing part D following the lease period. The current aggregate license has a 30 meter setback from the aggregate license boundary and that essentially lies along the north side of part C and D on figure one and therefore no agri extraction is permitted within Part C and D. So by allowing the lease of Part D for uh, lands for a specific period of time, Durham Stone Paving can continue to extract up to that 30 meter setback uh, based on their current agri license and then rehabilitate these lands in accordance with, with their license. So now uh, you should see the policy context slide. Yes. Let's hear again. So um, I'll just touch on some highlights of the policies um, in terms of the, the county official plan policies and, and West Gray documents as well. So the county official plan designates most of the lands as primary settlement area. And a, there's a small portion of the lands uh, directly adjacent to concession one that's designated as rural. That small portion is also identified as being within the agri resource area. However, looking at the air photos, it appears that most of this area is wet and therefore the aggregate potential for this small portion is, is not suitable for aggregate. This combined with the fact that it's adjacent to the settlement area of Durham and adjacent to some existing residential uses 
makes this small portion of land not suitable for future agri extraction. Appendix A of the County Fisher Plan identifies a portion uh, of the subject lands within the wellhead protection area for Durham. The County Fisher Plan does not identify any environmental constraints on the subject lands. So based on a staff review, the development of the subject lands within that primary settlement area for the long-term care home, as well as other uses, conforms to the county's official plan. With respect to the West Gray official plan, there was an official plan amendment known as uh, local official plan amendment number three um, that was approved by the county in 2016. LOPA three designated majority of the subject lands as residential and included some specific policies for a portion of the lands. At the time of LOPA three, there were questions as to whether or not the land shown as part C and D in figure one, and that's what we call the future extension of the South Street East lands. Um, there was a question of whether or not those would be required in order to develop all the lands that were designated as residential. Given that the lands of the county would be acquiring are different from the subject lands in LOPA 3, part of those site-specific policies no longer apply um, as the county is acquiring uh, beyond the lands designated in LOPA 3. Notwithstanding this, it's county staff's opinion that the site-specific policies have been addressed as the county is acquiring a portion of the industrial lands being, again, that future extension of South Street East, which can be used for municipal roads and servicing in the future. West Gray staff have agreed with this interpretation and have indicated that they have no issues with the land exchange occurring. Should council move forward with the land exchange, the county will work with West Gray to develop an overall concept plan for, for those lands. There was another site specific policy in local official plan amendment number three, which requires the completion of what's called a D6 study. And this is required to address any mitigation measures that may be required to ensure that the development of the subject lands will be compatible with the adjacent gravel pit. And prior to completing this D6 study, the county wants to work with West Gray and the community to develop an overall concept plan that would maximize the development of the site and would address the needs of the community in terms of things like affordable housing, seniors housing, accessible housing, and of course the new long-term care home. West Gray staff supports that process. Another site-specific policy in local official plan amendment number three notes that a record of site condition is required for addressing historical use of the site and possible soil contamination. And during the time of, of LOPA 3, it was assumed that a record of site condition would be required as the lands were previously designated as industrial. GM Blue Plan has completed a phase one and two environmental site assessment for the property. And they note that the record of site condition regulation is based on actual property use. And since the property is outside of the license pit, it's not deemed to have industrial use. Based on this, it's the county's opinion that a record of site condition is not required to develop the residential lands. The county will, of course, work with West Gray staff on these matters should council move forward with the land exchange. With respect to the West Gray zoning bylaw, the majority of the lands are uh, zoned as medium density residential with a holding. Other portion of the lands are zoned as extractive industrial, a small sliver of institutional and an industrial zone. And again, that's the, the future uh, South Street East extension lands. Any development on the lands would occur within the medium density residential zone. The holding symbol attached to a portion of those lands can be removed by West Gray Council once a detailed development proposal has been submitted. Municipality West Gray staff have noted that they are satisfied that a zoning bylaw amendment is not required to develop the new Rockwood Terrace. For the development of the additional lands, the ideal zone would be the mixed use zone. And West Gray has noted that this can be addressed as part of the update to the zoning bylaw, which they are planning to do later in 2020. With respect to due diligence, the county has had pre-development consultations with staff from West Gray, Soggy Valley Conservation Authority, and the Source Water Protection Authority. And no concerns have been identified with respect to developing the subject lands. There does appear to be some wet pockets on the East lands, and we have engaged uh, Saugeen Valley to determine if there are any hazard lands or regulated areas on site. And SVCA has confirmed that there are no regulated areas or hazard lands identified on the subject lands. 
There is a potential storm sewer that exists on the lands identified as B2 in figure one. And this will be investigated further as part of the overall stormwater management plan. SBACA did note that historical species at risk occurrences have been identified within a square kilometer of the subject lands. And based on existing information available to county staff, it does not appear that these species at risk occurrences occur on the lands, on the subject lands. This will be investigated further as part of future studies and investigations. With respect to further due diligence, the county hired GM Blue Plan to conduct a phase one environmental site assessment and a scope phase two environmental site assessment, which identified no major concerns. There were several fill pile samples that slightly exceed uh, the residential criteria, meaning that these fill piles cannot be used for residential development. And GM Blue Plan recommended that a condition be included in the agreement requiring that Durham Stone and Paving remove those piles to the county's satisfaction prior to completing the actual land exchange. And those, those conditions have been included in the agreement that's attached to the report. There are also a couple piles on site that contain broken pieces of concrete. Those would also be removed by the landowner. And the approximate location of those fill piles are identified on figure one in the report, uh, which should also be currently on your screen. So now I'm going to go to the next slide. <clears throat> so the image on your screen should be uh, show the uh, an air photo of the county quarry. And the county quarry is located on Gray Road 40 in the municipality of Gray Highlands. There was a previous report that was presented to council back in 2019 which provided options for the future of the county quarry, including selling the quarry or leasing it. And that, a link to that report is uh, also attached to this, this staff report. County Committee of the Whole passed a motion in June 2019, which was endorsed by County Council in July of 2019, which directed staff to pursue the option of leasing the county quarry. Council at the time expressed a desire to retain some value with the quarry, and therefore wanted to pursue the option of leasing it to an outside operator. Based on this motion, staff began working on a leasing process. And you heard that from uh, Director Pat Hoy and our CAO, Kim Wingrove, that, um, that staff started working on that process. And before this process could result in the issuing of procurement documents, the land exchange proposal was made and therefore was put on hold. In order for Committee the Whole to consider this land exchange, Council would need to approve reconsideration of the previous motion to pursue the option of leasing the county quarry. Just go to the next slide. So on the slide, uh, on the screen, hopefully it's the valuation the slide. Uh, so the previous valuation of the county quarry valued, uh, valued it at approximately $1.4 million. And this is based on the Altus report. This valuation has been confirmed by an independent third party quarry expert who has valued the county quarry between 1.4 million and 1.5 million. There are some existing stockpiles on site. Those have been valued at approximately 215,000. And therefore the total value of the quarry with those stockpiles is approximately 1.62 to 1.72 million. The lands in the town of Durham, as I mentioned, are approximately 32 acres in size. And recent property valuation has estimated that land designated as residential in Durham is at least 52,500 per acre, which then values the lands in Durham to be at least 1.68 million. Recent property sales have indicated that 52,500 acres may be on the low side with a recent property selling in Durham for approximately 125,000 per acre. So it's estimated that the value of the 32 acre property in Durham is somewhere between 1.68 million to approximately 3 million. There are also other benefits for the lands in Durham. So the initial development phase, of course, would focus on the new Rockwood Terrace. And this needs to be completed by 2025 in order to meet the province's timeframes. The exact location of that new facility will be determined as part of the overall concept plan and follow future studies and investigations. As mentioned previously, 
it's estimated that approximately four to six acres of land is required to redevelop that. So the additional 25 acres can be used to develop other things. Uh, it could be used to develop, a, for example, a campus of care model, whereby a variety of housing options and services could be provided, allowing residents to age in place. This could include affordable apartments, senior bungalow townhouse units, and retirement home units. Open space and trails will also be a key consideration so that residents and families can enjoy the outdoor space and stay active while they are progressing through different stages in life. There are also other significant benefits with the lands being located adjacent to the existing Rockwood Terrace. Things like moving residents and equipment from the existing location to the new location will be much easier with it being in close proximity. Future options for utilizing the existing Rockwood Terrace facility and integrating it as part of this overall concept plan will also be possible given that it's adjacent to these lands. The subject lands have also, as I mentioned before, have the ability to connect to five existing public roads. And in addition to this, the 32 acres represents almost 3% of the total land area in the settlement area of Durham. So by having a larger land holding, it allows for the creation of a long-term complete community vision when it comes to developing these lands. So notice of the possible sale of the county quarry was published in the advance on Wednesday, March 18th, and was posted on the county's website on March 19th. If Committee of the Whole decides to recommend the proposed land exchange, staff would then move forward with finalizing the exchange of lands, including preparing a bylaw for Council's consideration. Staff would also then move forward with completing the required studies to develop the lands, including submitting applications to West Gray as noted previously. The funds required for any future studies and, and the applications for redevelopment of Rockwood Terrace would be funded from the Long-Term Care Redevelopment Reserve. Should Committee of the Whole not recommend the proposed land exchange, then the process to lease the county quarry to an outside operator would resume. There would also be the need to, to start the search for lands to construct a new long-term care home. Uh, it should be noted that the original deadline set by the province to confirm a site for the new long-term care home in Durham was December 2019. In terms of financial and resource implications, a survey of the lands within Durham will be required. Uh, that's estimated to cost approximately $10,000. And it's proposed that, again, this would be funded from that long-term care redevelopment reserve. The funds required to reconstruct a new long-term care facility will be covered by the county and the province. And the county has set aside funds to redevelop Rockwood Terrace, and it's estimated that this will cost approximately $35 million. Almost there, Mr. Ward. <laughs> so the motion before Committee of the Whole is that this report be received and that pursuant to the sale and acquisition of land policy and sale of land procedure, that the quarry be declared surplus to the needs of the county, that the value of the quarry together with the value of the stockpiles be established as equivalent to the value of Durham property, that the quarry together with the stockpiles be sold through an exchange with Durham Stone and Paving Inc. for the Durham property, pursuant to a conditional agreement between the county and DSPI. Um, and that was, again, mentioned as made effective February 27th, and that's attached to the report. And that the Durham property be purchased pursuant to the provisions of that agreement, and that any costs associated with the land exchange be funded from the Long-Term Care Redevelopment Reserve, and that a bylaw be brought forward to council to approve the agreement and the county's entry into further agreements contemplated therein. So I apologize for the length of the presentation. However, this is an important topic and staff wants to make sure that council has all the information that you need in order to make an informed decision. And we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that, Randy. And you're, you're very clear and, and concise. And again, thank you for your written report because uh, it covered, I think, basically everything that we've gone through uh, this process. Uh, do, th just before I go to questions uh, on this, Madam CEO, do I need any comments from our solicitor on this report or only if there's questions asked? 
I think only if there's questions asked. Okay, well, thank you uh, for that. And uh, Madam Clerk, I think I saw some that there's a few questions. And am I right, O'Leary, Councillor Desai, and Robinson? Is that the three that I saw? Yes, Councillor O'Leary, Councillor Desai, and Councillor Robinson. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. So uh, <clears throat> moving on then. So, Councillor O'Leary, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, so, my first is just a comment. Uh, we have three letters here from Miller's, Sutherland's, and Aggregate. All three are major drivers uh, in our economic uh, throughout the entire county. So I think we owe it to them to at least consider what they're saying in their letters. Um, what I want to ask is, uh, the, the one that concerns me the most is the one from Walkers. Um, actually, it's from their solicitor, David White. But he's saying that we could be leaving a million dollars on the table. So why, why could we not put the quarry up for sale um, with a minimum bid. I, I don't understand how the, how the purchasing or selling goes legally, but if it's worth a total of 1.72 million, why don't we put it for sale with a minimum bid of 2.72 million and, and let these guys either fork out the cash or forever hold their silence? Because I'm not interested in it, in leaving a million dollars on the table on behalf of, the, of Gray County taxpayers, if, if that's possible. So I, I'm going to maybe go to Michael on this, Madam CEO, just on the valuation, is that correct, Madam CEO? Yes, you, 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 can, you can do that. I think the question comes back to, um, has the county seriously undervalued the quarry given the potential to mine below the water table? And I think the critical point there is the potential. And um, there's, there is no assurance at this stage about what an application to um, amend the, the current license might result in. And so I'll let Michael speak. And I think Randy also knows quite a lot about this particular aspect of things. Okay, thank you, Matt. And I'll go to Michael. Uh, to the extent that um, it addresses that you'd be looking for legal advice on this, I'd suggest we do that in close, but I believe Randy can speak comprehensively to the valuation outside of the legal advice. Yeah. So uh, just before I'll, Randy, uh, just before you go ahead there, Randy, just the evaluation that was done in Randy's report, it talked about uh, a third party independent that reviewed the valuation. Do you want to make any comment to that before I go to Randy, in a sense of the process that went through? Um, I think Randy can, can okay. speak to that process. Okay, thank you, Michael. Randy? Yeah, so um, to, in terms of, uh, so talk about the valuation in, in general. And um, Kim, Kim mentioned this in terms of the valuation can only be provided based on what is approved today? So what the current license allows for today for the county quarry. Um, so right now that obviously is a, an above the water table uh, license. So the valuation can only be based on what's, what exists today because we can't speculate as to what the value could be if the approvals were, were applied for and, and because we don't know if that would actually happen. Um, so approvals would be required in order to extract below the water table. Um, the valuation of the quarry, as I mentioned, was based on information from the Altus report. There was an estimate on the existing stockpiles that were also added to that valuation, as well as, as I mentioned, the independent third-party quarry expert. Um, so the, uh, we reached out to that expert to get uh, a valuation on, on the existing quarry. And it, uh, that's, that valuation came back at 1.4 to 1.5 million. And based on the Altus report that was previously made, that estimated about 1.4 million. So we're pretty confident that the current value of the quarry as it exists today, as plus the stockpiles, is between that 1.62 million to 1.72 million. Okay. And, and uh, back, back to you, Councillor O'Leary. Okay, well, I, I'm not... Uh, First of all, I'm not interested in going, uh, looking into licenses for below the water table or anything. I'm just, I'm just saying, like if, 
if someone tells me that or appraises my house at three hundred thousand dollars I can still list the property for 499 or 599 and get what I can get. So that's what I'm asking. If, if someone is saying that the quarry is worth X number of dollars and these guys are saying you're, you're going to leave a million dollars on the table, why can't we sell the quarry the way it is for 2.72 million as the minimum bid and give these guys the opportunity you either fork out the cash or we can forget about these three letters. Okay, um, any further comments from Madam CEO or uh, Michael or Randy on that? At this time. Okay, so I, I guess just in, just in clarity, it's, it's sort of part of what's being proposed is we're doing swap for land to swap the land. So I guess I just want to put it out there, is, is the value of what the land's being swapped for is somewhat considered it could be valued lower than what maybe is in place too. I think Randy, you spoke to that, uh, that uh, from your calculation of uh, 54,000 or something per acre, but then more recent sales in, in Durham have suggested it could be higher per acre. Is that what you were saying in your report? So yeah, it, I, I guess what I'm trying, go ahead. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Is that we're, we're estimating that the value of the, of the Durham lands between 1.68 million to approximately 3 million. Um, and as I mentioned, there are other additional benefits for, uh, for that we see having the lands in Durham being adjacent to the existing Rockwood Terrace facility, um, plus some of the other points that I mentioned previously. So, so that's why you know council needs to obviously be comfortable with 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 uh, ensuring that at least there's the equivalent value between what what we'd be acquiring through the Durham lands based on uh, what we'd be potentially giving up, so to speak, with the quarry. So in the end, uh, the, you know, based on the valuation to date, um, we feel that there's at least an equal equal share between the property in Durham and, and the county quarry, but council at the end of the day needs to be comfortable with that decision. So just for clarity, we're not putting this up for sale, we're swapping value of one piece for the value of the other piece. So in the sense, going back to Councilor Leary's point, we're leaving a million dollars on the table. I guess the question back to Councilor Leary is, is the value of the quarry equal to the value that we're trying to obtain? And I guess, it, it, and I'm only throwing that back in the sense of, are we, is that value fair to the value of our swapping? Because this is not just selling the property we're making a land swap here. So, and I think Michael, you made that point clear a while back with regards to process. We had to have those appraisals done. And I don't know if you wish to speak to this anymore about one for the other, because that was sort of what's been negotiated here. Is that correct? With respect to what was put out there before, um, what I, I would, say at this point um, is that I hope everyone has available to them um, the report that uh, was brought forward in closed session with respect to the legal advice uh, on the topic and if we want to go into that more I'd be happy to to do that but perhaps um, in a closed context okay thank you for that Michael I'm going to go back to Councillor Leary I just want to make sure that your points got across before I go to the next question. Councillor Leary, uh, is there any Just for clarity, did I, Randy, did I hear you say that this land that we're swapping, uh, or the land that we're getting, is worth 1.6 million to 3 million? Yeah, that's correct. That's based on uh, existing um, or previous property valuation, as well as recent property sales. We're estimating it to be in that range. Okay, that's a really big range, but that's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Leary. And then I'm going to go to Councillor Desai. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, one of the letters also mentions the fact that, uh, that they were given very, very little notice. And, and part of that could be to do with the fact that this was advertised only in the flesh in advance, um, which, despite being a terrific uh, newspaper, doesn't exactly have a large readership base. Um, so my question is, is there merit to deferring a decision on this today 
uh, to allow further input from, from the parties that have indicated that they would like to provide further input. So I'm gonna take you that question to Madam Clerk in process first, and then I'll, I'll branch out. For, so Madam Clerk, process, uh, I think it was explained to us a month ago at our last meeting. Do you wanna speak to that at all, Madam Clerk? So through the land um, acquisition, sale and acquisition policy, the um, notice is to be put in the uh, most appropriate newspaper within the area. That was the uh, advance. Now it also was printed in the Dundalk Herald um, because they um, do often do the very same thing yep. as the advance does. And it was also posted on the county's website and it needs to be posted for three weeks and that's what it was. Okay, thank you for that clarity, Madam Clerk. Back to you, Councillor Desai. Um, no further questions. I was unaware that it was on the county website, so at this point, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, and through you, Warden McQueen, um, Director Schwartzer, thank you very much for the very detailed report and presentation. I just would like to go back to planning process and how it will be applied at the local level, specifically the holding provision. So in terms of the discussion at the local level through council and then uh, returning that, uh, that decision back to county council and staff, what time frame and what does that process look like? Um, uh, Randy, do you wanna, or who would sure. like to take? Thank you, through you, through you, Mr. Warden. Um, with respect to the, the holding symbol, um, so that's attached to subject lands, so that can be removed by West Gray Council. And the requirement to remove the holding symbol is, is indicating that once a detailed development proposal has been submitted. And as mentioned, I think the, the desire from staff, as well as um, when we had some initial discussions with West Gray staff, is develop an overall concept plan of what this site could look like. Um, we want to try to obviously maximize the, the development uh, of the 32 acres. We want to look for opportunities in terms of trying to address some community need, uh, whether it's affordable housing or whether it's uh, something else. Uh, we want to make sure that um, we're able to maximize the, the, the value of, of these lands. And, and so once we've developed that overall concept plan, that would address the holding symbol requirements. And then West Gray Council can then lift that holding and then we can proceed with the development. And so that's one of the kind of the first steps that we want to do uh, with West Gray and with the community to come up with what that could look like uh, for the lands in, in Durham. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Robinson. Mr. Uh, Madam Warden, Clark, is, I have uh, uh, Councillor Soever. Okay, Councillor Soever, you have the floor. Yes. Um, I, I share uh, Councillor O'Leary's concerns here. Um, you know, we, we talked about the quarry before and, um, you know, we looked at different options. We had a valuation of 1.4, 1.5 on that. And, um, you know, we, we said, well, let's look at leasing it, you know, to see if we can do better. That process didn't go very far. Um, and now we're moving forward with a swap. And, you know, I was all in favor of the swap, um, but now we've got three reputable quarry operators coming up and saying, well, guys, what are you doing? And, and one is actually saying we're leaving money on the table. Now, um, you know, I know we looked at a lot of different pieces of land um, for this, and I, and I gotta be careful what I say here because those were discussed and closed. And, um, you know, we, we looked at a lot of different pieces of land. Um, and, um, you know, obviously cost was a factor in some of our decisions. However, if it turns out that the quarry is actually worth more, um, you know, some of those other sites then may become viable. And I can't say any more than that, um, really, unless we were to go into closed and, and talk specifics. But, um, you know, I think our decision really hinges on um, what value somebody might pay for the quarry. Um, 
And um, it sounds, well, talk is cheap. The only way you're really going to know is if you put it out and say, okay, in seven days, let us know what you're willing to pay and, um, you know, deliver a check. And um, if people say no, then I'm happy with the swap. But, uh, you know, I am too, I am concerned that, you know, to have three people come up and now say, um, well, guys, um, you know, we're very interested. Question is, are they? And um, so I do have a concern, but I, I think the swap idea is still good. But, you know, it's just a bit surprising that you, you get three expressions of interest is um, but the question is, are they real expressions of interest or are they just want to throw a monkey wrench in the plants? So the only way you'd find that out is, uh, you know, ask them to firm them up. Okay. Um, can I ask okay. if, if there's interest then in, in taking a discussion into closed session? That's what I was just going to ask, Madam CEO, if... Uh, because I know that you mentioned it um, a few minutes ago that the search for property, I think, in Durham started back in October. And I'm not going to get into other details other than you mentioned that just a few minutes ago. And I think you also mentioned that. Uh, that's not, in that was specific to this particular piece of property. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And, and also, I think it was mentioned that we were supposed to um, uh, secure a piece of property for Rockwood by December of 2019. And so I know we're, we're moving on. So I think there is some sense of urgency and sense of securing property too. So uh, Madam C, are you suggesting then that, that we go in the camera then to maybe cover some of those details that we can't speak in open? Because obviously there was discussion that had happened between your staff and the parties that are involved, correct? Correct. So I guess process, is that, I guess just before I ask, process, Madam Clerk, to do that, does that mean we just go to sell our, our phone? How does that work? How do we go into camera in the sense of securing uh, this uh, as, as for in camera? Madam Clerk? Or maybe, okay. go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, a couple of things. I think um, Rob will uh, stop the recording or pause the recording while we go into close. Council members will need to ensure that their areas that they are in are secure um, for closed meeting discussions. And because the closed meeting matter was not on the agenda in accordance with the procedural bylaw, we'd need two thirds vote in order to um, amend the agenda to put that uh, on that motion on the floor. So basically, if I have a mover and seconder, Madam Clerk, it's gonna take two thirds to go in camera? That is correct. Okay, all right. Uh, anything else from you, Madam CAO, or anybody else before I, I put it to the question, if, or if anybody like to move? Seeing none. Okay, is there, uh, is there interest to go in camera? If so, please indicate by a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Potter, I'll move it. Okay, Councillor Potter, is there a seconder? Councillor Clumpus, I will second it. Okay. Okay, for everyone, uh, to, uh, there's a mover by Councillor Potter, a second by uh, Councillor Clumpus, that we move into uh, in, in closed camera. And just give me the clarity on that, Madam CEO, is that to deal with uh, property or, or how, what's the wording on that? Yes, you're, you're correct. I think two things. I think we are um, looking for advice from our solicitor. And this also has to do with the, um, the acquisi acquisition or disposal of property. Property, okay. Is that understood by Councillor Potter and Co Councillor Columbus? I'm assuming they heard me. Okay. Yeah, so uh, sorry, I, I probably should have added that, but yes. I just wanna make sure everybody's clear of the motion because we don't have it on the screen and I just wanna be very clear on that. Okay, um, process, Madam Clerk, as far as recorded, you wanna have a recorded vote or how are you gonna recognize everybody for two thirds? I think if um, if there are any opposed to going into closed session, they can use the raise hand feature. And, and I will look to those. Um, okay. And if there is nothing, then we can declare it two thirds passed. Mr. Ward. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Councilor Roller. It's Brian. 
I have to apologize. I had to, I had to answer the door. I didn't hear the motion. Can you read it one more time? Yeah. So it's moved by Councillor Potter, second uh, by Councillor Columbus that we move into uh, closed session with to to receive advice from our solicitor and also to deal deal with uh, acquisition of property. Thank you. And it needs two thirds uh, two thirds majority to to have it because it was not on the agenda. Okay. Is there any other questions before I call the vote? Okay, seeing none. Are there any opposed to going in camera? Madam Clerk? I see no hands being raised, Mr. Warden. Okay, I will then consider that is carried. And and Rob, you're gonna set the shut the video off. Please make sure you're in a certain Maybe pa pause for a moment and allow Rob to do whatever he needs to do. Uh, we're back recording now. Thank you, Rob. Okay. Well, he's, he's getting on to that. How'd it go? That's great. <laughs> All righty. Uh, he was just waiting to get back into open session. <laughs> um, okay. So then uh, moving on then to uh, back to the item that's on the agenda, and that's uh, item A. Um, uh, further, and that was moved by Councillor Leary, second by Councillor Desai. Any further discussion with regards to the item A? Uh, that the motion's on the floor. Mr. Warden, if I may. Yes. Could you just please confirm for council and the public that we only went into close for the purposes for what we indicated we were going into? I will. Okay. Thank you for that, Madam Clerk. Thank uh, you. The purpose, the purpose uh, why we went in camera, just get my uh, fellow sheet here, is we went in to speak to uh, litigation, issues of litigation, and also with regards to uh, property, property acquisition. And those were the only items, and that's the discussion was only to do with those two points. It was actually solicitor client privilege oh, okay. and acquisition, yes. Okay, I got the solicitor part. Right, yep, but, you did. <laughs> okay, it's a little harder. We would see it on the screen, and I, I was just scurrying through my notes here. So, yes, thank you for that clarity, Madam, Madam Clerk. All right, so now we're in open session, and thank you for, for following me along there. So now, we, like I said, we have the motion that's on the floor. Again, that was moved by Councillor Larry, second by Councillor Desai. Any further discussion on, on that uh, proposed land exchange, uh, county quarry and lands in the town of Durham? Any further discussion on that? Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have everybody online that's supposed to be online or on the-, on the uh, Yes, we taking do. Okay, very good. So, um, same process then, I will we'll then ask if there's any opposition to this motion. Any indication of any opposition, Madam Clerk? I see nothing in the chat and I see no raised hands, sir. Okay, the motion is carried. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to item B. This is with regards Mr. Warden, to the- May I yep. request a two minute break? You can. So let's do that at, uh, let's say 11.45, we'll take a two, two minute break. Okay, we will do that. I'll, I'll call this meeting back to order at 11.50 a.m. And moving forward to, with our next report. Uh, I'm on here, right? Everybody can hear me. Uh, our next item, item B is a treasurer statement. And I have a move by Councillor Patterson and Councillor Boddy. Um, is there any discussion on, and this is the treasurer uh, statement, Council's remuneration and expense uh, to be received for information. Any question or comments there? Okay, seeing none, any opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Okay, moving on to item C. This is with regards to the debt management policy. I need a new mover. Uh, I did originally have Councillor Woodbury. Would somebody like to move that? Councillor Carlton will move that. Councillor, okay, well, you were, you were the seconder, but <laughs> so you're moving as, as Councillor Carlton is moving that. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Christine Robinson, Carter. if you need one. Sorry? Oh, Councillor Council Robinson, I heard that, okay. Okay, so yes. that's on the Councillor Car uh, Carlton, Councillor Robinson. Uh, Cal uh, um, Mr. Weppler, would you, do you have anything to add or would you do, are you looking to do a bit of a presentation here or is it, you feel it's pretty self-explanatory? 
maybe I wouldn't mind giving a few comments. Just um, yep, go ahead. Go over this. So the the county's had very little debt in the past, and we've never had a debt uh, management policy. And uh, just um, moving into considering uh, entering into or taking on some some debt or considerable debt with long term care builds and additions, um, I thought it best that we we create a, a policy and. Uh, the province, they set out a limit in the municipal act saying that, you, you know, your debt limit is 25% of your own source revenues. What's being recommended in this policy at, at, the, at the current time is 10%. There is some leeway for that if the councillors want to take a little more risk than that. I, I've seen I've seen ranges from like uh, Wellington County being 6% to, to uh, Whitby being at twelve uh, percent, here and at twelve and a half, and I believe Oshawa is at fifteen percent. So there, there is some what council is comfortable with here. So I started as staff with uh, based on uh, readings from BMA, who do as the uh, municipal reports, where they say that uh, credit uh, when credit analysis are being done by those companies they look at a, a 10 percent to be a prudent range for for debt of your own source revenue so as staff that's where i started this this uh reporting on that so and i have included in there some illustrations about the the debt coming on what our financial statements will look like and what that will do to our arl and what then room you'd have left based on that 10 percent so at the, and in saying all that, at, at any time, part of that procedure states, you know, if council wishes to surpass that that limit of 10%, that it could still be done by a resolution passed in open session of council. So it's uh, and, wanting to put this out there. I think it's something needed now. We're going down, going down this road with debt for long-term care. And certainly it's a policy that gives guidance and, and sort, of, uh, sort of steers the ship. And certainly if there's unforeseen circumstances that does arise council does are, are, are charged to make those decisions if, if they feel need to change from what you're proposing for sure so I want to say also Kevin, uh, Kevin you, you've done a great job looking after everything and uh, at, you know so uh, kudos to you on that okay um, any question from uh, County Council on this policy Councillor Soever, I see your hand, so I'll, I'll recognize you first. Go ahead, Councillor Soever. Uh, yes, um, the own source revenue, uh, how is that defined? Like if you have uh, taxes that are unpaid, is that still considered or is that is it, is it taxes collected? Because uh, with the, the current crisis we're in, um, we, we've already had a lot of people concerned about how they pay their property taxes. And so I think, you know, I think we, we need to be prudent and I agree the 10% is a reasonable number, but um, I just wanted to get some clarity on that. Should our revenues drop substantially, which they might, um, it, it is our unpaid taxes considered in that. Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, Kevin, do you wish to answer that question? I would say the way, way these are recorded based on, um, we're, we're not going on a cash basis when we're, we're doing our financials, that those would be as a receivable, so they'd be shown as, as part of your own source revenues until you decided you needed to write them off or, or there was an indication of that, right. that was going to be the case that you'd have to bring that up, you know, identify that with your auditor that that revenue is not, uh, you're foreseeing that it's not going to be achieved. I think that would be a discussion that we'd want at that time. Does that answer? Yes. Uh, thank you. Okay. So, so just remember that it's, 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 it's still due until you write them off. Right. So. No, okay. The, the belief you have with your auditors that that is not something that's going to be, you'd have to identify <laughs> That, you know, this is in jeopardy and stuff. So I think that'd be something to be a note then in your financial statements and, and be addressed. But at the end of the day, there's the process of tax sale and all that, that also then secures that value too, right? Right. And, and yeah, yeah, and right also would occur. Yes, yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank you for that. Councilor Swerver. Any other questions uh, to this report from County Councilors? I see nothing, Mr. Warden. I will note that um, Rob has sent a note to say that we are live. 
just okay. happened. So. Okay. Thank you. Just like, just like that. Very good. Yep. Well, we, we were on our best behavior. We know that. So that's uh, fantastic. Welcome for those that are uh, joining us live. Um, okay. Seeing there's no other, we're on item uh, C, FRCW 0820 debt management policy. And uh, again, that was moved by Councillor Carlton and second by Councillor Robinson. Any further discussion on that resolution? Okay, I don't see any indication. Any opposed? Hearing none or seeing none, that's carried. Okay, thank you for that. All right, so moving on to the memorandum of, uh, of settlement. Uh, this is uh, under grant. And, and so this is uh, moved by Councillor uh, Mackey, second by Councillor Boddy. Uh, Mr. McLevy, do you have anything to add to uh, this report? Thank you, Mr. Warden, and uh, good morning or afternoon. I'm not sure what it is right now, but uh, thanks for the time. This is a pretty straightforward report. This is uh, negotiations that we've been doing with Unifor, representing employees at Rockwood Terrace. There's not a lot to add other than the, uh, the piece where we were mandated with a 1.62% uh, budget and we've managed to negotiate within the 1.62%. But I think more importantly is the task force that has been put together for long-term care gave us a few different things that felt that we could do better at um, scheduling for employees and getting people to be available in long-term care and we're happy to say that we've managed to get over some of those hurdles so i think it's uh it's a good news uh report this time around and we're trying to follow the same conversations with lee manor and gray gables coming up later this year we're good well, thank you and thank you for all your work there uh, mr mcclivy and uh, questions from county councillors are there any questions? I see nothing coming up on the chat or any hands raised. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Seeing none then, I'm gonna uh, call the question then. Um, any opposed to this resolution? Hearing or seeing none, that is carried. Okay, moving on to item E. This is a tender award for Gray Road 29. And this was moved by Councillor Burley. Is Councillor Burley with us, Madam Clerk? Yes, I think. Okay. We understand that yes, he's he having is. still some technical difficulties on his end that's impacting his ability to hear. So I'm not sure that he'll be able to respond. Okay. So maybe I'll look for a different mover. Is there? Some, I have I have seconded by Councillor Mackey, but is there a different mover? But somebody likes to move this report for the construction. I'll move a cash to Okay, Councillor Desai, and second by Councillor Mackey. All right, uh, that's regards to the report. Uh, Pat, do you have anything to add to your report? Yeah, just some very quick thoughts. Um, we feel that this job, we're, we're kind of tackling it as one of our essential jobs that we still tendered, even though with uh, COVID and the, you know our work uh, processes are gonna change here, but um, the window doesn't start until June 22nd. So we've got some time to work with our contractors on exactly how they're going to maintain uh, social distancing but one thing that we've heard a lot from OGRA is they want these jobs to go contractors want the jobs to go um, essential public safety road work is you know basically approved by the province um, so that's kind of where we went ahead and and uh, closed this tender and we'll work with our contractor on uh, you know probably lightening up on liquidated damages and those types of things um, right. try to work with the contractor to get our, our key jobs done this year because we feel if we don't do this section we could be in trouble maintaining this through the winter so that's why we want to go ahead with this tender. Okay uh, thank you for that uh, Pat and um, your, 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 your protocols will certainly address the, the current status of COVID-119 for distancing and all that stuff I presume and will you, you'll be putting signage up, uh, since this is, uh, if this gets supported today, you'll be putting signage up to let the community know that this is happening? Yeah, there'll be pre-construction signage uh, that we'll do for the, uh, at the pre-construction meeting, we'll discuss that with the contractor. Very good, thank you. Okay. Mr. Warden, uh, uh, yes. Councillor Millen has raised his hand. He has a question. Okay, uh, welcome Councillor Millen, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, 
Pat, have you made allowances for uh, staff that may have gone into Walters Falls and can't find their way out? They're all still there. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. That's fine. Thank you. I'm sure, Councilor Millen, if you're driving through, you're probably picking something up for the farm at the mill there, right? Uh, well, uh, undoubtedly, if not at the uh, at the uh, the hotel. Well, maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for that. Any other uh, questions, uh, the county councilors? I see no right. the chat or no hands raised. Okay. Thank you. And. Uh, Seeing there's no more discussion, any opposed to the motion? Okay, seeing none, I'll, I'll determine that's carried then. So then um, moving on our agenda, we have other business and we have the first part is a COVID-19 update and I presume Madam CAO, you're going to speak to? I am, or? yes I am. Thanks very much, Mr. Warden. Um, so County Council, since my last verbal update on March 30th, the province has issued many directives and guidelines that are impacting our operations, particularly in long-term care and paramedic services. Our priority in everything we do remains public safety and the safety of our staff. Over the past month, we've made significant changes to our operations to protect people and to do our part to minimize the spread of the virus. The Great Out CDA COVID-19 page is clearly highlighted on the website and holds all of our COVID-related resources um, for staff and for the public. And all other uh, Great County websites like Visit Gray and Made in Gray point back to this one. Um, our county telephone lines are answered during business hours and 211 is available to the public 24-7. In this respect, the county has provided a small amount of additional funding to 211 to support additional staff so that they can um, stay on top of the increased call volume that they're experiencing. Within the Greek County Administration Building, we are operating with a bare minimum of staff. We are keeping up with accounts payable, court administration, planning applications, and a very large volume of requests for support in social services. Jody and the IT team have done a stellar job of getting everyone connected and working effectively from home. I think one thing that we can take away from all of this is that uh, iPads for yourselves are not ideal for a remote meeting and we will include a, ch a change back to laptops for consideration in next year's budget. We've also been made aware, and this is for all of you going forward, um, there are increased security threats circulating out in, in the world and everyone is reminded to be extra vigilant when it comes to securing passwords, not accessing links to external sources, etc. The province has provided additional funds for our use in responding to COVID-19. There's additional funding for long-term care specific to our response, as well as a general 1.5% funding increase. We're still waiting for a case mix index and some other specifics on this and we anticipate having a report for you to consider in May. I know that many of you are interested in the social services relief fund that was released by Municipal Affairs and Housing um, last week. The province announced 148 million across the province and that Gray's allocation on the social services relief fund was 2.3 million. That money is being administered through the Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative, or CHIPI, and is intended to assist the service managers in supporting a range of vulnerable populations, including people living in community housing, supportive housing, low income, social assistance recipient, and others who require social services support, as well as those experiencing homelessness. So just a few um, details around this funding. Um, first of all, it's an allocation over this entire fiscal year, so April 2020 through to March 2021, so we need to be conscious of the fact that there will be a recovery phase to these funds as well as the current acute phase. Um, what we've been given um, notice for is that we'll receive 50% of those funds, so 1.15 million in April, and then another 25% in July of 578,000. The final 25% would come to us in September if we can provide um, justification of an ongoing need 
other, otherwise those funds will be dispersed to other places with a higher COVID need. We're still in the very early stages and working hard to get an idea of um, actually how the funds um, will flow to those most in need. We did provide immediate support to OSHARE to address the huge demand for meals and as well to Y housing. We're reaching out to agencies that provide housing and homelessness services for vulnerable residents um, to see where they're at and the identified gaps that they have in their service. We're seeing shelter needs for quarantine and self-isolation and also the requirement to provide um, shelter to homeless folks to ensure that they're able to maintain the, the required distancing and minimize the spread of infection. We estimate forty to fifty thousand dollars a month over and above our our regular uh, budget um, just for that emergency housing. Funds will also be needed for isolation services. So if people are in isolation and um, they need to be brought food or there's enhanced security required for the places where where they're staying. Um, we know that later on in this process, there'll be increased demand for sustainable housing benefit to cover rental arrears. Um, so we're hearing from, from the um, charities and, and other um, groups in your communities. We're asking anyone who reaches out to us that we don't normally work with to um, complete a short application form so that we are staying on top of all of those requests. And then Anne-Marie will bring back a status update uh, to you um, in May to give you a sense of what we've been able to fund, where we have um, some questions for council to consider, and the things that are maybe outside of the mandate of these funds that you may wish to consider under some other um, support mechanism. With regard to social services, um, the province has expanded access to temporary emergency assistance under Ontario Works for those in financial crisis who have no access to other supports. Uh, this funding will help cover needs such as food, rent, medicine, transportation, and other services. The temporary assistance will help to bridge uh, many applicants that would be in crisis until the federal benefits are uh, rolled out and received. There's an online application that's being released today and demand is expected to rise in the coming weeks. Um, currently, we're seeing one emergency assistance application for every three full OW applications. Staff are working through individual circumstances to determine what other sources of income may be available, such as CERB or, or EI. The cap that we normally work under for discretionary benefits has been lifted in order to issue emergency benefits uh, for COVID related expenses to our existing OW and ODSP recipients. And that's an emergency $100 for an individual or $200 for families. Despite face-to-face -face access no longer being an option, staff are reaching out and increasing contact via phone, email and text um, to make sure that our clients are supported, informed and that their needs are met. Um, we are monitoring the trend reports that we get on the kind of calls that are coming to 211 to see where um, there are gaps in service or unmet needs so that we can help our partners step up in that respect. Um, on the child care side, um, you'll recall that the child care centers were closed by the province and remain closed as the schools are. And there's been no update from the Ministry of Education as to a timeline when this may be lifted. Our priority as a great county is to um, ensure that we're retaining these childcare businesses and the workers in the sector so that we have a childcare system when the state of emergency is lifted. The centers have received operating allocation up to the end of um, the second quarter for 2020 and reimbursement for childcare subsidy for the month of March, which is paid in arrears. We're waiting for additional direction from the Ministry of Education to determine what financial supports can be flowed to operators moving forward to assist with that sustainability and staff retention. And um, we're maintaining a question and answer document for providers as information becomes available. And they staff are holding uh, weekly teleconferences with the operators just to check in and ensure that if they have any unanswered questions, we'll get them the information that they need. Our home child care providers 
um, are in a similar circumstance. They, those home child cares are not operating either under the direction of the a medical officer of health. We intend to flow um, money to them similar to what they received in March. Um, should the provincial direction change regarding the flow of funds, we'll come back to you to council for with options to consider. The hope is that if we continue to provide them with funding, they will may remain rostered with Great County Home Child Care. Um, the home child care workers are reaching out by phone and email to the individual providers, again, similar to what we're doing with the, uh, with the operators. Uh, our special needs resourcing agencies are also um, moving into this electronic service delivery um, age of that we're in and reaching out to parents and, and helping and providing help through social media, phone and email. So we're really hoping that no one's being left in, in a crisis situation without some kind of support around them. Moving on from there, just to speak to transportation, um, our winter control season wraps up April 15th, and Pat and his team have taken a look at the manpower necessary to complete critical tasks that need to be done before we get to next winter's winter control. Um, we've adjusted activities to, complete, to be completed by a single person, um, in a piece of equipment or um, using staggered shifts. So trying to, you know, as Pat just mentioned, trying to get to that social distancing and keeping our staff safe. Um, this does have some impacts on our, the efficiency that we can undertake all of our regular tasks with. The net of all of their deliberations is that we won't hire any backup or summer students this summer. Um, and we'll just run with our full-time complement and the nine seasonal employees. Um, regarding, like, you can appreciate that there's a lot of work that happens in transportation from a maintenance perspective that needs to keep intersections and sight lines safe and just that uh, maintenance of um, uh, structures and bridges and that we, we do need to stay on top of that. Um, regarding the 2020 construction, um, on April 1st, uh, purchasing advised the public that um, one released tender, which was the bridge replacement on Gray Road 9, was being cancelled. And that some tenders that we had released were being delayed for further, until further notice. So that included the tenders uh, for Gray Roads 11 and 15, Gray Road 2, and a microsurfacing project on another portion of Gray Road 2. So the paving projects that are going ahead are Grey Road 4 in Durham, Grey Road 9 in Southgate, Grey Road 15 in Meaford, Grey Road 19 in Town of the Blue Mountains, and uh, Grey Road 29 through Walters Falls. So that's with that. And then um, you also have seen um, from Economic Development, Culture and Tourism, they've been doing some significant outreach and education to assist the small business community. Um, they've developed a lot of resources in just three short weeks, including that community and business resiliency map showing what businesses and services are available. Um, the Economic Development Working Group, which is Savannah's team, and then all of the local economic development officers are working together and um, able to uh, reach out and provide support, advice, and guidance to businesses um, on, a, on a very uh, quick turnaround. Um, this group is already thinking about recovery and what needs to happen when restrictions are lifted. I also wanted to give kudos to this group because they were among the first to be trained for redeployment into long-term care and there are 15 of our economic development, culture and tourism staff who've been trained to support long-term care. With regard to paramedic services, things are stable at this time. There's been a huge amount of work put into forward planning to keep the paramedics safe with the appropriate PPE and making sure that we have enough supplies and planning response scenarios should the situation here become more critical and our hospital facilities exceed capacity. The service has been working in partnership with public health, fire police, hospitals, the community agencies and the private sector on many aspects of this preparation and response and I believe that these strength and relationships will be of benefit to us during this recovery period, but certainly beyond that. They've done a great job in coordinating those donations of PPE, and that you've heard earlier that that stuff's being stored at uh, Grey Roots and, and being taken out to the services that, that require it. 
Similarly, in long-term care, there's been a vast amount of work done to safeguard the homes and, their, and our home staff and pre prepare them to respond to an outbreak. Jennifer will be providing a, a detailed summary to the committee um, in the meeting that follows this one. I wanted to finally say that there have been questions about staffing and whether or not we should consider layoffs. So um, I will speak to the staff utilization today and I know Kevin mentioned it a little bit here. We are looking carefully at our cash flow and um, as we get a better sense of where we are financially, we'll be bringing that information to council. But specific to the staffing, if we look at all of the Gray County staff and we pull out the paramedics and the long-term care staff, that leaves us with a complement of 250. And as I've noted in this report, for some of our uh, departments, their workload has actually increased uh, during uh, this crisis response in places like social services and housing. And other departments like finance, HR, legal, court admin, planning and clerks are still needed to provide those critical functions that they always provide. So out of the 250 staff that are considered quote unquote non-essential, non that are there are 90 that are available to be redeployed to other duties, either in long-term care, housing custodial, or for future requirements. So far, we've trained 28 to work in long-term care, and there are another 30 scheduled to be retrained next week. Um, at the outset of this crisis, I told staff that we would want to continue to support them for the time being, as long as they were working and willing to be redeployed. If they should refuse a redeployment request and they don't have a medical reason for, for that refusal, then the messaging has been delivered that they'll be replaced on an unpaid leave of absence or in other words, laid off until the situation resolves. So at this time, I'm not anticipating the need for layoffs. And when I talk to um, my other county colleagues across um, the, the Southwest, um, that would be a, a very, I think a, a similar tag that most of them are taking. We need these people and we're going to have a tremendous amount of work for them to undertake during the recovery phase. And as we try to, you know, deal with a, a backlog of, of work that's, you know, kind of accruing right now. There are some counties that do offer library services or some of those things, recreational services. Um, and, and sometimes those staff are treated differently, but um, that's not the place that we're in, in in Gray County at this time. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but that's kind of the, the Coles Notes version of where we are right now. Well, thank, thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam CEO, for that lengthy report and very much uh, uh, very in-depth. Um, and I want to take this time to thank you on behalf of County Council for all the work that you're doing and staff. Uh, you know what? You guys are doing an amazing job. And I just wanted to let you know that we're quite proud of the work that you're doing. Are you able to send that out to all county councillors? Because there's quite a bit of information in that, Madam CEO. Yes, I, will, I would have sent it earlier if I could have got it done earlier. So I will, <laughs> I will send it out to all of you this afternoon, absolutely. Okay, well, thank you again for all your hard work. And I think I saw Councillor Desai indicated that he had a question. Councillor Desai, are you there? Yes, yes, uh, Mr. Warden, thank you. Um, I, I guess if, if, we're going, if we're going to get the report in the afternoon, I'll look it up in there. But I just wanted to ask, um, with regards to the CHIPI funding, if that could be accessed by food banks, uh, because we do have a couple of food banks in our, in our municipality that have been uh, um, asking for funds uh, or and they've one of them uh, had a volunteer specifically contact me and, and refer to the provincial funding that was supposed to flow through the municipal service managers so my question is uh, whether the JP funding can be used accessed by food banks and to how if they can how can they access it thank you Anne Marie, if you're on the line, do you want to just speak to the specific um, how, you know getting an application for Josh and, and that Oh, maybe she's got troubles. Oh. Okay, there is, there's an application, as I mentioned in the report, that we've asked that people complete, and then we'll be um, looking at, at all of those and, and trying to, you know, 
put some priority around them and, and making sure that um, you know, we've got the, the right things covered off. So um, maybe what I'll do when I send out um, this report, I'll also include the application form with you. And then if you're asked directly, then you can at least have that document to be able to provide to someone and, and with the instructions of how to get it back in here. Would that work? That would be perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, thank you, that Councillor Vassal. Is there any other questions to the report that uh, Kim made? That uh, anybody on your chat there, uh, Madam Clerk? I see nothing, Mr. Warden. I just have a few things to uh, just discuss here, or just bring up to date. As your warden, uh, as you're quite aware, we declared I think it was March 26, and I see all the lower tier municipalities had either declared before or after that. Um, just there's just one sort of housekeeping that was sent out and I saw a few responses that is this is a different type of a, uh, an emergency situation than most if we need to call on all one representative from all the lower tiers please get that into uh, our clerk's department or whatever just in case it's only a, something really elevated and I know in speaking to uh, Barb Compasser a few weeks back uh, she uh, had raised that and, and certainly want to make sure that if, if there is a, an elevated situation that we have a representative from each municipality sitting at that table if, if the need arises to that point. Uh, as your warden, I'm quite busy uh, with regards to uh, speaking on behalf of County Council uh, through either a commercial on Spotify, which Rob sort of got me set up for, and part of that is all about washing your hands, and certainly in a number of different town hall meetings with uh, Bruce Power, and we get our kudos to Bruce Power for the, all the, you know, efforts that they're doing. They're content, you know, they are a great corporate citizen in our area, and we're so lucky to have them in our area for what they are doing. Again, a big shout out to Dr. Era, who is, you know, part of the medical health, uh, officer of health for uh, Ray Bruce Health Services, and again, he's a great source, a reliable resource, and. Uh, you know, as he says, uh, people are concerned, but people aren't scared. And, and for him, his leadership is, has certainly uh, proven very strong for this during this situation. I certainly have been in lots of meetings uh, with your local MP, MPP, certainly Lisa Thompson since up a town hall session uh, once or twice a week. So I'm certainly um, plugged in on, on, on regional issues uh, along with our CAO. Um, Again, uh, I want to thank our CAO and staff for all the hard work that they're doing to get through this, and we will get through this. It just, uh, we have to uh, bunker down and be safe, as, uh, as Dr. Aris says, it's, it's coming, and we have to be prepared for that, and we are as a community, and that's a big part of what we are as a strong community, and, and we work through that. Again, this is the Easter weekend coming up, so I know there's, there's, there's uh, we're being reminded that uh, certainly communicate with your family through electronic means, but uh, again, we have to keep the physical or, or, the, or the social distancing there and, and, and we have to stay put and it's, it's, it's about saving lives. That's you know, the big part of what we have to do and, and, and we're doing that. Again, as, as Dr. Aris says, continue, continue to wash your hands, wash your hands. He said his mother taught him how to do that and that's what he remembers and I'm sure we've all heard that from Dr. Aris and it's, it's very important. So I don't know if you have any questions to me, um, but uh, certainly I'm, I'm available anytime, those that wish to reach out for me. And certainly if you have concerns in your community, I know every day through probably your own EOC meetings or us at the county, you know, certain things arise and, and uh, you know, we're getting updates all the time, both from federal or provincial. And I know that the, uh, the essential business list got uh, changed there on Friday, so it continues that. And, and our CIO and other staff keep us informed, and, and, and that's great. So at that point, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, stay safe, and I don't know if there's any questions or comments from other county councillors. Any comments? I know you're, you're having your own uh, EOC meetings that are keeping yourself in the loop too and, and that sort of thing. So anything more from you, Kim or staff? I think um, one, one thing that last Friday, Dr. Era sent something out about um, whether consideration should be given to some sort of a centralized um, tip line or place to receive these um, complaints under the um, emergency orders about people gathering and non-essential businesses and that sort of thing. 
So I had some preliminary discussions um, with your CAOs. Um, we're, it's just that the police and the, the health unit are feeling, I think, quite overloaded with handling this and we're looking for someone else to take some of the weight off of their shoulders. So I will um, continue to work with your folks to see if right. there's a, a way forward that, that we could provide some support to, the, to those people um, as acting kind of as a central spot, but we're still trying to work through those details. There's one more thing on the agenda as well, I think from Kevin. Yes, I will get to that. Uh, if there's no other comments with regards to COVID-19. I know that this is an Easter weekend and there is concern of people moving around and I think as Dr. Aris has, you know, tried to, you know, refrain from non-essential uh, travel. And I know that uh, the announcement that came out on Friday that uh, even, you know, short-term accommodations are, are not allowed unless it's in an emergency with re relationship to COVID-19. So seeing there's no other uh, comments out there, uh, I'm going to move over to uh, Kevin uh, with regards to the June tax install installments from lower tiers. Uh, Kevin? Thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, just I did uh, I surveyed the treasurers and, and got their comments about what each local municipality was doing to provide tax relief for with with this emergency that's, uh, that's ongoing. So many have deferred their next interim payment or they've waived penalties and interest and um, but also out of that, a number of them were asking, could the county provide some relief on the June payment uh, to the county, it's the second installment of, the, of the, the county's installment, similar to what the uh, education tax, what the province has done with education, moving that, uh, and deferring it to, to September. The municipal acts wrote a little different when it comes to the county in, in, the, in that upper level tier uh, commitment, but uh, mine's intention is with tax policy I'd still I'm working towards that to provide that that payment for those that can't make that payment would be interest-free for those 90 days and then in essence wouldn't be wouldn't be required until September 30th so it's a little easier way to handle it through the bylaws and, and um, but that's uh, we're working through now and working through our cash flows and um, maybe have to call in some of our investments that are coming like that are coming due but uh, I believe that the county can do this, and uh, but in the same sense, we'll you know we'd show that being due that in June, and because some municipalities said they'd be able to, to cash flow some of that to the county that they had collected, so that's kind of where I'm going. Those that are really needing it, there would, would be no pose of any penalty, and I would give them relief to September. So that's how I'm moving forward with this. Okay. So is that like September first or, or September September thirtieth? Thirtieth. Okay. And you're communicating that to all the treasurers, like you said, right? Yeah, that's what I said. I was worth working yeah. on. So I, my first survey was what each of them were doing, and 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 all of them were able to do their March uh, installment to the county. So that that's come and and stuff. And then it was just discussion what they were going to do forward. And and then and a number of them mentioned about could the county do something similar to what the province did with the education taxes that were due at the end of June. So. Right. I think the important part here is, and it's great that you're offering that. Is you're deferring it, but it's still due. Yeah, yeah. You're just, yeah. You're just deferring it, right? Well, and hopefully we're we're back to some normalcy, but uh, yeah, it's yeah. step in times, right? Okay. Any question from uh, county councilors uh, with regards to uh, Kevin's verbal report? Anything, Madam Clerk? Nothing, Mr. Warden. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, seeing there's no other discussion there, uh, are there any notice of motions for upcoming uh, meetings? Any notice of motions? Okay, I see none. Uh, well, we're at that uh, time of the day where I have an adjournment. I have moved by Councillor Miller and second by Councillor O'Leary. At this time, we will adjourn at 12.30. All, is there any opposed? What's that? <laughs> okay, that's carried. Well, very good.